perfect wall. The concept of the perfect wall is probably the very best place to start learning about building science. It's where I started and it's unbelievably helpful in presenting the relationships between the control functions in our walls and the finish functions. The thing to remember about the perfect wall is that it's not a real wall. It's a conceptual wall and it's best understood as a teaching tool, again, to understand the proper relationships between the components of our walls. Now you can certainly design a real wall that closely matches the perfect wall, but when you design a real wall, you have to make all kinds of decisions that the perfect wall tells you nothing about. The perfect wall will just generically show you the cladding, for example. In a real wall, you have to decide specifically what that cladding will be and how it will be attached to the structure. You have to decide specifically what that water control membrane will be and how it will be applied. These are not small decisions and a lot of care and consideration goes into making them. But the perfect wall is a great place to start. Now that said, before we can understand the perfect wall, it will help to identify what we need our walls and really our buildings to do. Now here it makes sense to think of the building as an environmental separator. We want to create a particular set of environmental conditions inside, different from the conditions outside. We want to be able to control this interior environment and adapt it to suit our needs. And we want to be able to do that regardless of what the conditions outside might be. When we speak about the building as an environmental separator, we use a special term for the layers that separate the inside from the outside. We call those layers the building enclosure. So we know we want to use the building enclosure to separate the inside from the outside so that we can create a particular set of interior conditions but let's get more specific about what that entails. Our enclosure must be structurally robust and fire resistant. So these are prerequisites. Next, the enclosure must permit us to create a comfortable interior environment. We want it to be thermally comfortable. We want to have good indoor air quality, be acoustically comfortable, etc. And finally, we want the enclosure to be durable, and low maintenance. How then do we go about achieving these goals? We know we're gonna need some control layers and we know we're going to want to control water, air, heat, and water vapor. We also know that we're gonna to need to protect the materials themselves from damage. And then once we've separated the inside from the outside and protected our building materials, we need to be able to condition the interior environment to our liking. What's interesting and helpful about this list is that it basically captures all of building science. The first two items cover enclosure design and the third covers mechanical design. It's also the case that the first two items really permit the third. We need to first separate the inside from the outside in some kind of durable way in order to mechanically condition the interior environment. I take a great deal of comfort, relief even, in this list. It puts what can seem like endlessly complicated design decisions in perspective. In enclosure design, all we're trying to do is separate the inside from the outside and protect the building materials themselves. That's it. We don't need a water control membrane for the sake of having a water control membrane. We need a wall that doesn't leak. We don't need an air control membrane for the sake of having an air control membrane. We need a comfortable interior environment. We don't need a vapor control membrane for the sake of having one. We need a wall that doesn't rot. Whenever I'm struggling with a particular element of enclosure design, I return to this list and I ask myself what my goal is. How is whatever it is I'm considering contributing to or detracting from something on this list? Does it help protect other building materials or does it contribute to the character of the interior environment? Okay, now we're ready to discuss the perfect wall. 
And the focus of that discussion is going to be how the perfect wall contributes to these first two goals of enclosure design. This is the perfect wall. And it works in every climate and for every construction type. Let's walk through the components together. From the exterior to the interior, we have a cladding, a drainage and ventilation cavity behind the cladding. Then we have our four control layers, thermal control, water control, air control, and vapor control. And the thermal control layer, the insulation, is shown as the outermost of the control layers. And the water, air, and water vapor control function are shown as a single membrane. Then we have the structure, any kind of structure. Could be a mass structure, could be framed, whatever. The three most important relationships that make the perfect wall so universally functional are that one, the control layers are located outboard of the structure. And here they are best positioned to protect the structure. Two, the thermal control layer is always the outermost of the control layers. And three, there is a drainage and ventilation space behind the cladding. The location of the water and air control layers tends to be pretty intuitive to most people. It's easy to understand why we position them outside the structure and how they permit us to separate the inside from the outside in a durable way. What tends to trip people up are the thermal and water vapor control components of the perfect wall. And we'll walk through that together. In one sense, the thermal control part is easy. We know we want it outboard of the structure because we want to keep both the interior and the structure warm. Heat stresses structures too, right? But that's not the only reason we've got it where we've got it. We also use it to control condensation. It has a durability function. It helps us protect our building materials from damage. It will help us here to understand a bit about condensation. For condensation to occur, moisture, usually moisture-laden air, must reach a cold surface. No cold surface, no condensation. To control condensation in buildings, we have four options. We can, one, warm the condensing surface, essentially preventing the problem from occurring in the first place by not having anything cold. Two, we can prevent moisture from reaching the cold surface. Three, we can remove moisture from the environment, perhaps by dehumidifying. And four, we can allow the condensation to occur, but make it so that it doesn't present a problem, either by using materials that aren't moisture sensitive or by providing drying. In the champagne on ice example I'm showing, we're pretty happy to just let the condensation happen, right? Maybe the label on the bottle will peel a bit, but nothing we really care about gets damaged as a result. Let's take this concept and go back to our perfect wall. Let's think about how it will perform in winter. In winter, it will be cold outside and warm inside. Everything to the exterior of the insulation will be cold, just like the outside, and everything to the interior of the insulation will be warm, just like the inside. Now, do we have any cold surfaces to worry about? Yes, on the exterior. Do we have moisture-laden air? Yes, on the interior. But do we have a problem? No. We don't get condensation because warm interior air never reaches the cold exterior surfaces. Let's think about the same wall in summertime. Now it will be warm outside and cool inside. Everything to the exterior of the insulation will be warm and everything to the interior of the insulation will be cool. Remember that we've located our water control layer and our air control layer on the interior of the insulation. And this means that these control layers will be cool, just like the interior. So we've just identified a cold surface. Do we need to worry about condensation? Yes. Warm, moisture-laden exterior air can indeed reach that cold surface but notice where the surface is. It's outside. It's on the outside of the structure and it's on the outside of the control layers where it can safely drain away or evaporate. It's pretty neat, huh? If we flip the perfect wall down, we have the perfect slab. 
we can eliminate the cladding, but the other elements remain and they're in the same order. The control layers are all outboard of our structure and the thermal control layer is outboard of the rest. Similarly, we can flip the perfect wall up to create the perfect roof. Again, notice the consistent ordering of the materials. The control layers are outboard of the roof structure and the thermal control layer is outboard of the other control layers. With the perfect wall, vapor control isn't actually all that important. Whatever materials we use to control water and air could be permeable or impermeable and our wall would still work. The reason is because we're controlling condensation using insulation. If we go back to our four options for controlling condensation, we're depending entirely on this first one. So what's all the fuss about the permeance of our building materials? Well, for one thing, we know that even if our walls are perfect, our construction is not. We tend to prefer building materials that are more vapor open so that our walls can dry in both directions. But the other part is that we don't always actually design the perfect wall. This is for all kinds of reasons, including exterior insulation being expensive and the perfect wall perhaps not always meeting our aesthetic intent. When we start splitting up the control layers and moving them around, we often need to add new control layers in new spots to address new cold surfaces, where the permeance of these materials once didn't matter now we've made it critical. The classic example of this is the standard wood framed residential wall. From exterior to interior, we've got a cladding, a space for drainage and ventilation, a water and air control membrane, exterior sheathing, cavity insulation, and interior drywall. Notice that the insulation is no longer outboard of our water and air control layers or our structure. Let's put this wall in a cold climate in winter. Where's our condensation risk? What surface do we need to be concerned about? The interior surface of the exterior sheathing because it will be cold and we'll get condensation when warm, moisture laden interior air reaches it. But we build this wall a lot. So how have we made it work? We've made it work by making sure that the water and air control membrane is relatively vapor open and we use that space behind the cladding for drying. The sheathing gets a bit wet from condensation and it dries through the water and air control membrane into that space. The second way we make this wall work is by limiting how much interior moisture reaches the cold surface to begin with by providing interior air and vapor control. Often the painted drywall is sufficient to do this by itself without any special design consideration on our part. But sometimes in colder climates, we install a special membrane there and detail it to be continuous, specifically to reduce the amount of interior moisture that can reach our cold sheathing. If we go back to our condensation control list, this standard cavity insulated wall works by following options two and four. It reduces wetting and provides drying. Now we know from experience that this wall works pretty well. So why isn't it the perfect wall? Because it is far, far easier and more reliable to control condensation using temperature than attempting to control air and hoping for enough drying. It's especially hard to achieve the perfect balance of wetting and drying when we expose this wall to different exterior environments and to different interior environments. For example, if we put this wall in a very cold climate, we might not be able to make our interior air and vapor control membrane perfect enough to sufficiently limit wetting. We might not be able to provide enough drying either. Now, similarly, if we raise the interior relative humidity, we risk upsetting our wetting drying balance and rotting our wall. Our interior air and vapor control membrane can also create a brand new summertime problem for us if we air condition our building. It becomes a new cold surface for us to worry about. Now these aren't hypothetical problems. All of these stresses are conditions that routinely cause failures. But the perfect wall can tolerate all of those stresses. It works everywhere, in every climate and on every building type. Now it's still not always appropriate. Most of the time in professional practice, we're not designing perfect walls. 
but it's helpful to know that we monkey around with the permeance of building materials only because we're not controlling condensation with insulation. We pick low permeance materials when we want to reduce wetting. We pick high permeance materials when we want to increase drying.